Well, good morning. Welcome again to Central Church. We are a Jesus church where everyone is welcome, where no one is perfect, and of course where everyone is loved and where anything uh, is possible. Uh, today we start our in-person services again uh, in the church. Uh, every Sunday we're allowed 30% of capacity, which gives us around 100 people uh, that we seat uh, comfortably in church. So feel free to join us if you'd like to join us in church. But remember again, it's, it's a choice that we make. And if you don't feel that you're comfortable yet, that's perfectly fine. That's why we continue with the online services uh, for all of those of us who, who don't feel that this is a time for us to come back yet and that's wonderful that we have this gift of being able to be uh, online uh, as well uh, there's lots of interesting things happening with the family ministries and i'm going to give Kerry Bida uh, an opportunity to tell you all about that hey everyone so easter is just around the corner and we are thrilled this year to be partnering with camp kintail to bring each of our families Easter in a Basket. Easter in a Basket offers eight fun and meaningful Holy Week experiences. All of the activities and supplies are found inside the box, one for each day, starting on Palm Sunday and ending with Easter. Each section includes a mini lesson with scriptures, story reflections, and a prayer. Each day also includes an activity that connects. Some of them are games, some are recipes, um, some are crafts, and some are service activities. You will also make your own Easter basket step by step throughout the week. Our hope is that um, this box creates ways for you to connect with your family and with your faith throughout um, the time leading up to Easter. The boxes will be delivered to each of our families during the week of March 22nd uh, with our prayer that it will be a blessing to your family this Easter season. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Really excited about all of the things that are happening. Um, remember, it's Communion Sunday today, so if you don't have your bread and your wine or grape juice ready yet, uh, you still have a little time before we get there. Right after the sermon, we're going to have communion uh, together, so you still have a little time uh, to do that as well. Continue to pray for folks who are going for surgery, folks who are struggling, folks who, who need our prayers, folks who have lost loved ones. Um, all these things have happened. Please pray for our folks uh, and thank you that you continue to do that. Uh, Tuesdays, the prayer group gets together and they pray. You can check uh, the website for information about that if you would like to join them uh, with that as well. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this amazing day that you've given us again. Thank you that in a little while we'll be able to sit at your table and experience again that wonderful gift of, of your forgiveness, that wonderful gift that reminds us of what Jesus came to do in this world. Thank you that we may belong to you, that your Holy Spirit ministers in our lives and lives in us and through us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life on that cross so that we might have life in all of its abundance. As we, we go into worship, Lord, and as we go into reading your word and listening for your word, will you please open our hearts and our minds to hear what the Spirit is saying to each one of us. This we ask in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. We all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. Just when all hope seemed lost. Open the door for us 
He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. There's no one unwelcome here. That sin and shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door. Let mercy draw you near. Just when all hope seemed lost, have opened the door. To the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail, you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who've loved and lost another, all the chained and all the free. All who follow, all who lead, anyone who's been let down, all the lost you have been found, all who've been labeled right or wrong, to everyone who hears this song. Have you ever noticed how often God uses signs uh, throughout uh, Scripture uh, to get our attention and to explain things to us? Take, for example, the rainbow that God puts in the sky to remind us of the covenant that he's made with us. The wonderful, wonderful sign of baptism is a sign of our, of our spiritual growth, of our spiritual birth into this world. That beautiful gift that we are going to see this morning of the bread and the wine that reminds us of the death of Christ that gives us life in all of its abundance. But one of the most touching signs that we read of uh, in the Bible, and I think we often miss that, is, is that handwritten sign that was commissioned by Pilate and that was nailed to our Lord Jesus' cross. I'm going to talk about that with you. And to help us with that, we're going to go to John chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 19 to 22. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. 
The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, when we read this, there are so many questions just come to mind about the sign. Why would, why would he put a sign on Jesus' cross when all the others didn't have a sign? Why were the chief priests so, so angry about the words that were written on there? Why was, was uh, Pilate so adamant that he was not going to change any wording on the sign? Why was the sign written in three different languages? And maybe for me, the most interesting thing about the sign, why would something as simple as this, be reported in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Each one of them tells us about the sign and what was written on the sign. Here's the thing. I'm not going to try and answer all those questions. Impossible to do that in, in, in one sermon. But could it be? Could it be that this simple wooden sign was a, simple, was a symbol Sorry, uh, of God's passion for this world to get to know his son and to know why his son came into this world. This sign was there to explain exactly who Jesus was and what God's mission was in this world to give us life through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Now against this backdrop, let, let me try and, and, and say two things about this sign. Make two suggestions. Could it be suggestion number one? That God is prepared to use anyone to further God's purposes for this world in this world. That God would use anyone. Let me explain what I mean by that. So to understand this, I'm going to take you back to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, we read of Jesus and these two criminals who are taken and then they are nailed to the crosses and they're put on the cross. And as they're hanging there, the one says to Jesus, and, and he's rude and he's mean to Jesus and he's mocking him. He says, well, if you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself? And by the way, why don't you just save us as well and get us all off the cross? The other criminal is angry at him and says, don't, don't do that. I mean, we deserve this. He doesn't. And then in verse 42, he says these amazing words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't beg, save me. He, he doesn't plead, have mercy on my soul. Did you see what he's doing? He's like a servant who's appealing to the king. Jesus, king, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? Why? Why would he see Jesus as a king who has a kingdom? Could it be that this man read that sign and understood exactly what it meant? That year he was lost, nothing left for him. He's just going to die and that's the end. And then he reads a royal proclamation. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And as he reads that royal proclamation, he pleads for the king for royal help. Could it be? I mean, this was just a wooden sign proclaiming the gospel of the cross. And yet, and yet a man who read this was saved in that moment. Now, here's the thing. This is not what Pilate intended. Pilate's intentions are seen very clearly in the wording of that sign. 
That sign says, this is what happens to a Jewish king if he crosses the Romans and oversteps his boundaries. All that's left is he's crucified like a criminal and a slave on a cross. Pilate wrote that because he wanted to put the fear in the Jews and he wanted to mock the Jews. But God, but God, God had a different plan. And unknowingly, Pilate becomes the scribe of heaven, writing exactly what God was putting in his heart to write. And a man reads that. And who knows who else? And his life was saved. My suggestion was, could it be that this sign says that God will use everyone and anyone to further God's purposes in this world? Even Pilate, even me, even you. Can I make another suggestion? I think this sign says that God will use any kind of language to get our attention so that we can live up to God's expectations and become who God wants us to be in this world. Let me explain. So we read the sign was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. Aramaic was the, was the language that the Jewish people spoke in Judea and Galilee in Samaria. So all of them would be able to read that sign and know exactly what it said. Latin was the la language of the Romans, but it was also the ju judicial language, the language of the law. And when it was written in Latin, it was written and it says, this is what it says. Greek, and, and, and this is the most beautiful part of this. Remember I told you this at Christmas Eve. Greek was the lingua franca of the day. Everyone spoke Greek and understood Greek. That was, that was the vehicle that God used to spread the gospel throughout the world. That's why the Old New Testament is written in Greek. Because people could read it and understand it and speak it. So no one who passed that cross could say, I could not read what was written on that cross. And I didn't understand that. Clearly it was written. This is the king of all kings. For every tongue and every nation and every people in this world. And here's the thing. None of them, none of us can say, I don't get that message. But at the same time, it also poses a question to each one of us. What language is God speaking to you, my friends? And, and I'm not talking about your dialect. I'm talking about the language of signs that God uses in your everyday life to speak to you about your life in Jesus Christ and how you are living that life to be an instrument in the hand of God. What language is God speaking to you? Can I give you a few examples? Sometimes God speaks... The language of abundance. Maybe your belly is full. And all your bills are paid. And you even have some money that you can put away in the bank. And maybe God is saying, I blessed you in this abundance. Is it possible that you could take some of that and bless someone else from your abundance? And they can see in that my hand. We've seen that happen, Central. We saw it at the end of 2020, where we all went through a year of COVID, and God blessed us in such abundance at the end of the year that we could say, Lord, we have more than we needed. And we could take that, and we could give it away and not just hoard it. What a wonderful moment to hear God speak in the language of abundance, and we could answer in the sign of saying, Lord, we will listen 
and we will give. We've seen that central when we do our summer outreaches and we take care of the food bank. And remember how I challenged you when we spoke about, was it 200? And I said, come on, we can make 2,000 just, just a zero. And actually, we, we surpassed that number because we heard God's language of abundance that God spoke to us and we could give and be faithful. Sometimes God speaks the language of need. And forgive me if I give the best bad example that I have. February 2002, we landed in Canada as a family. When we left South Africa, my wife Elsie knew that we might not see her mother again. Actually, we thought we would never. We actually thought mom was going to pass away before we left. Mom didn't. We came. We landed. Boy, it was a difficult, <laughs> difficult time. We got a phone call from her brother. If I'm not mistaken, in, uh, in the beginning of April. And he said, you better come. Mom is, mom is dying. With God's grace, we, we saved money ahead of time and we bought Elsie a ticket that we had ready for her to use for this moment. And Elsie got on the plane, flew, stayed for a month. Mom didn't pass. Elsie had to come back and she came back. She was back maybe three weeks. And we were walking in a place that doesn't even exist anymore, in, in a Sears store. And the phone rang. And it was Elsie's brother. And he said, I've got to tell you, mom passed away. And we knew Elsie would have to go back. But my friends, we had nothing. We didn't have the money. And the ticket was $2,500 at that stage. And Elsie, Elsie wanted to go. And we decided, well, well, we'll find it. We'll make that. But she has to go. Said nothing to anyone. On Sunday, I announced to this church, Elsie's mom passed away. Would you please pray for us? That was it. Went home. Monday's my day off. Tuesday, I came to the office. And as I tried to open my door, it was kind of stuck and I had to push it. And, and I realized there was something underneath the door. And I bent and over and then I picked it up and it was an envelope sealed. And on the outside of the envelope was written for Elsie to go bury her mother. We opened that envelope. And in that envelope in cash, was $2,500. And in that moment, God speak, spoke to us in the language of need. And God says, I called you. I brought you here. And I've got you. I'll take care of you. Don't you worry. I'm there. Sometimes God speaks in that language of giving up. Giving up what, what you thought that you could never do. And we understood that too. Because when we left in 2002, we left the mother who was passing. And I left my mom and dad who are... <laughs> Parents of one child and I am it. And we took away their three grandchildren. We understand this language of sacrifice, giving up for the Lord. But every day, as we look back over 19 years being in this place, we thank God for that language because we know that God said, I want you to come and work here. And if you listen and if you are prepared to sacrifice, I will take care of you. And my friends, we have been blessed in more than abundance to this day. And every day when we look up in the morning and we see God's wonderful world out there, we sing that song, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Because even when we sacrifice and we hear that language, he is faithful. 
and he walks with you. I don't know what language God is speaking to you. But could I ask you to look carefully? Maybe there's a sign. Could I ask you to listen carefully, to hear what he's saying? Because you don't know the treasures that are waiting if only we listen to the language that God speaks. And this morning, I invite you to see the signs as we are going to break the bread and share the wine. Signs of God's love that says, my son died to give you life. And once you've tasted and you've seen, there is no way that you can walk in this world and not speak that language of love so that people might hear. So as you go into this week, go listen carefully. And who knows what signs God has for you. Amen. Father God, thank you that you speak in any language. Thank you that you use us, Lord, despite often of who we are. Thank you for that sign that said, Jesus, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. And they could try and crucify him as a slave, as a criminal. Nothing could stop. Nothing could stop us to see that this was the king. And what a king to give his life, to speak the language of sacrifice so that we might live a life that is filled with the abundance of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The honor and the glory belongs to you. Amen. Welcome. This is the table of the Lord and it is prepared for you. What a wonderful moment to share the sign, the bread of forgiveness and the wine of release. Where the Lord Jesus says, look at these signs. And when you see, remember, remember me. Listen to the language that it speaks to you. So as we gather around the table of the Lord, let's pray for the Lord's blessing. And I'm also going to lead you in the Apostles' Creed as, by, as part of our prayer. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this amazing table, for this sign of your love. For the sign that says, you're on my arms that reach out to you and hold you. Here are the gifts of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, my son. Where you remind us, Lord Jesus, as you eat and as you drink, remember me and what I did. We pray for your blessing, Lord. Bless the bread as we break that bread in a moment and share that. Bless the wine as we are reminded of your blood that was shed for us for a perfect redemption. We thank you that you speak loud and clear. In this moment, Lord, we say the words that the church has said for so many ages. And we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the night that our Lord Jesus was delivered into the hands of the soldiers and those that would take him to his cross, 
He reclined at the table with his disciples. And he said to them, I've longed to share this moment with you. And then he explained. He took the bread. And as he broke the bread, he says, this is my body. This is for you. Take this bread and eat. And every time you eat, remember me. So as we take this bread, remember this is a sign that his body was broken as a perfect redemption for all of our sins so that we may be made whole in Jesus Christ. So let us share in the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing this world to break your body, to take all of our sins and to put it on your body so that you might take that for us and we, Lord, might be forgiven. As we eat this bread of forgiveness, we give you thanks that we may know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. After the meal, the Lord Jesus took the cup of thanksgiving. And as he blessed this cup of thanksgiving, he says, this cup is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. Take this cup and drink, each one of you. And as you drink, remember that my blood was given as a perfect redemption for all of your sins. So take this cup and drink the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your precious blood. Thank you that as we stand beneath the cross and your blood flows, it flows over us and it cleanses us and washes us and makes us brand new. Thank you for reminding us of that in the word, Lord, when you say that there at the cross, that IOU that was written against us was washed and doesn't exist anymore because it was washed in the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for the gift of your blood. Amen. As we say goodbye and as we part from the table, Let's say a prayer of thanksgiving and I'm going to lead you into the Lord's prayer as part of this thanksgiving prayer. So let's pray. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. For they are new every morning. New every morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is in me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all of the deeds that the Lord has done for you. Bless the Lord, O my soul. For I have sat at the table of the Lord, and I have been fed on the finest bread and the finest wine of the gifts of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, here as we pray together. 
our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. And now as you go into this world and into this week, go with God's blessing. The grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the King of all kings. The love of God, our Heavenly Father. And the constant closeness, care, indwelling of the Holy Spirit will be with you. Amen.